Voices from Oxford has come to the Oxford Internet Institute this afternoon to talk to the new uh, incoming director of the Institute, Philip Howard. Good to meet you, Philip. Thanks for having me on. Uh, you specialise in a very important area of, uh, of research at the moment, which is the impact of the internet and cyber security and all those other sorts of things on, on, on the way we handle ourselves. And one of the uh, really interesting areas that I've picked up from some of your talks has been the idea of, uh, of the internet as a medium for propaganda and how this is something that we need to get our brains around. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Certainly. It's, it's not just that it's about propaganda, misinformation, or fake news. Mm -hmm. It's about how the social media platforms we trust are being used purposefully to direct propaganda to voters in sensitive, you know, at sensitive times and a few days before they need to vote. Right. So it's, uh, you know, I think there's more propaganda than we're used to seeing yeah. over social media, and it's being very smartly targeted. Yeah, I guess it's always been true that propaganda, which is after all an old art, has been targeted, focused at people from where they are and, mm -hmm. and, and pulls the right, uh, th the right levers. But I guess the power of the internet and the big data analytics behind it give it an extra special angle nowadays it didn't used to have. Absolutely, because it allows the, the propagandist, the person behind the propaganda, to choose the people who are going to be most sensitive mm. to particular photos, particular words. And so it's, it's much more of a, a specialized craft, a targeted craft, oh, yeah. uh, than, it, than it has been in the past. And, it, and it's a real profession almost, isn't it? There are, there are, there are units of people set up to, to analyze our activities and tailor the messages in, in the right way, which... Yes, now you're talking about the advertising industry, right? Uh, advertising and the political, I exactly. guess. So it's, these are skill sets and platforms yeah. that are one and the same. So they Facebook are, is a powerful tool for targeting soap advertising yep. or asparagus advertising. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's also very powerful for people who want to target political ads. Yeah. I think one of the things that has caught many of us off guard is that the people who are doing the targets can be foreign governments. Right. or a political campaign. And we didn't really think that was going to happen. I, think, I, don't think we, I don't think we anticipated that authoritarian regimes would directly meddle in the elections of some of the world's strongest democracies. Yeah. And it's probably shown their weaknesses. These are strong democracies, but they're, they've got feet of clay. In That's them. right. Well, there's a sensitive moment where voters need to decide, and we sort of trust that they'll spend a few days at least mm. thinking about it. They won't think about elections all year long, but... Mm. For a few days before they vote, we right. hope that they'll spend a little time reading the news. We hope they'll show up and we hope they'll vote. Mm. Um, and it turns out that, that media can be used, uh, digital media can be used to get directed messages and interfere with that, mm. that deliberative process. I think the, the analogy you make with ad, the advertising trade is an interesting one. It's almost as though it's market segmentation going on, identifying your customers and putting adverts at them. Have you been surprised how effective that has been in targeting certain sectors of voters that really respond to... Respond well? Yeah. So I think um, the Internet has long been used from the beginning, has long been, has been used for uh, political targeting, micro-targeting. Mm -hmm. When I first did this kind of research, it was mostly about what we call political redlining. So figuring out redlining, figuring out which neighborhoods you don't need to spend any okay. time in. They're never going to go your way, and if you've got limited campaign sure. resources, you don't spend time over there. Yeah. And that was also bad for democracy because sure. it meant those citizens didn't get to see alternatives. They didn't get to see a vibrant debate. Yeah. Maybe a party sent a candidate there who was not as talented as the ones mm. being put forward in other districts. So the face-to-face the -face debates weren't as vibrant. Um, and that's, that, makes, that drags down the quality of deliberation yeah. for the voters in those districts. Yeah. But now it's, it's not just about the, the redlining. It's about a segmentation that lets you get different messages yeah. to different people yeah. based on some cues from their credit card purchases right. or their health records yeah. about what they're going to be responsive to. Yeah. And I guess this is a special instance of the sort of echo chamber that you that we often hear about in the uh, internet studies of, of people choosing mm -hmm. uh, to... To construct to their cons own, yeah. People that they want to hear from and that they feel comfortable hearing from and right. these would self-reinforce. There's certainly some self-reinforcement mechanisms. We, we tend not to use the echo chamber metaphor. No, we no, prefer no, the much more that, no. the scholarly term of selective exposure, which is yeah. the process by which we decide um, to pick the things, the news sources and the candidates that um, reify 
what we've already what we already. Believe. I guess that's human nature, in a way. Mm. To, you're in your comfort zones and so on, but perhaps yeah. it's much easier to to, to do on the internet. Yeah. Yes, I think we. It's it's sort of a self-preservation technique. Yeah. Um, it's sort of a, uh, um, a means of comforting yourself. I mean, the 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 notions of selective exposure are that we we go with candidates who belong to the party that we've supported in the past. Yeah. That's the partisanship explanation. These are all shortcuts. There's the notion that we go with candidates who won't contradict us, yes. right? Because we don't like to be proven wrong, and we don't like that cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And then we go with candidates or political ideologies based on some big package we subscribe to. So if we're conservative, yeah. we'll, we may choose the other things that other the conservatives government. seem to These be These sound like some pretty major logical fallacies here, yeah. of the, of the traditional sort there. You know? Absolutely. And that's why fake news, junk news, um, yeah. can be so powerful. It's often content that is full of argumentative fallacies yeah. that, that we might recognize as commentary, right. masking as news. But if it's got the BBC colors or the New York Times font and a, a credible yeah, picture, it, it looks like news. Yeah. So if it quacks like a duck, maybe it's a duck. Exactly. It may actually be a duck. We could feel very depressed about it and think this is just going to go worse and worse. We're going to hell in a handcart. Or do you think there are ways that we can, all of us, um, get wise mm -hmm. in realistic ways that we can, we can protect exactly. ourselves against the, both the segmentation, this uh, tendency to, to seek reinforcement, mm -hmm. um, this not realizing we're being targeted by parties with a, uh, an axe to grind and so on. Are there other things that people can realistically start to do that, m that may see us get out of this? Uh, Perhaps it's my mood at the moment, but I would say no. Right, okay. uh, I think the battle is lost for the internet that we have now. It's right. too, I, think it's, I think most people, most of the time, will need some kind of institution to encourage right. more diverse media diets or encourage social media firms to comply with the, the laws, right. the norms of democratic right. practice. And without those institutions to um, you know, give the social media firms a spank... So regulation, in the traditional sense, is really important. Is very important. I think we're past the point where industry self-regulation yeah. is, is sufficient. The question is, what kind of light touch yeah. can uh, bring out the best in social yeah. media firms and not not regulate content, because that's yeah. also a dark path. Well, exactly, exactly. So, and we have an issue, don't we, with different cultural norms in different countries. You know, mm -hmm. what's considered to be the sort of thing that's absolutely fine to, mm -hmm. to discuss, because this is all debatable, and what are the things you just can't criticize, and so on. And, yeah, so, and it is an international thing, isn't it? it? It's certainly an international thing. I would also say that there is a Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and it that's does true. include many principles we're all supposed to subscribe to. So yes, I, I believe in some cultural relativism, mm. but uh, I also believe in the Declaration of Human Rights, mm. and uh, included, in, you know, included in the principles enshrined there are, are the, is the notion that uh, we must all have access to media and the freedom of information, and you know, some of the terms by which some authoritarian governments want to regulate the internet don't fit right. with those norms. Right. Do you think those regulators need to be transnational regulators themselves, or do you mm. think each country can, can do it? The sort of things that I give us the next internet. I think it would be healthier if they were transnational, if they were global. And maybe if I could go back to your question about what's hopeful, um, I would say that we're in a, an important moment now where we can shape the design of the next internet, right. and if we don't, we'll be really stuck. Yeah. But you know, ahead of us is this Internet of Things, which will involve billions and billions of devices and sensors and chips embedded into everything that is human-made. Yeah. And it will be um, very different from the Internet we experience now, which you and I have grown up to have, uh, you know, experienced through a browser. Yeah. Um, this, this next internet will be, not be one that most of us experience. Through. Well, it's something that gives me a bit of worry in my own life, and I guess mm -hmm. with all of them, we, we all have these things that are yep, reporting on us every minute and, and so on. But even you buy things for the home, like smoke detectors from Nest or what have you, they're, they're tracking what, our behaviours through the yep. day and night. And, well, and even if you try to opt out, yeah. if you put a, a smart light bulb on your front porch yeah. and your neighbour tries to opt out, they'll still be recorded yeah. by yeah. your smart light bulb. So, so there's, the, there's some deep thinking needed mm -hmm. at society level. At the, the social the, level, yeah. And I think there are some ideas for what we could do okay, for that on. internet. 
Um, the simplest one is to allow data donation. So one of the structural problems we have with democracy now is that so much of information about us and what we want and what yeah. we value is held by private technology firms. Right. It used to be in the British Library or the Library of Congress yeah. or uh, at the BOD. You know, yeah, it, used to be it was either private or it was public. It was public. The census created yeah. the, uh, a great archive right. of what people aspired to have, yeah. um, social norms, social welfare. Um, now the Internet collects that good, rich data, yeah. but it resides with advertising firms right. and social media companies, yeah. not in a public space. So and some of them are surprisingly hold on to it, don't they? Facebook yes. is quite uh, guarded about Absolutely, because it's, it's part of their profit mm. you know, model to exploit that data. Um, I think for this next Internet of Things, you know, this is a world in which the social media data might be merged with the data from your sure. smart cities and yeah. your light bulb. Yeah. And, and I think we should start to plan for that Internet of Things and say, I, as a citizen, might want to express myself by sharing my data with my favorite hospital, mm -hmm. one or two charities, exactly. and the political party of my choice. Yeah. And social media firms can still profit yeah. from the aggregated data. And there's an enormous amount of public health research to be done oh. with the existing Facebook network data yeah. that is proprietary and closed. Yeah. So there's a sort of moral point there, isn't there, that for, that for a public good to come out of this, it, they do need to start opening up. Absolutely. And I'd push this one step further to say that there's a moral point. This is now a publicly traded company. Right. And so there's a moral point here that exactly. this, there is a higher obligation now that they should be... So do you paid. think in the, in the larger democracies these issues are becoming understood by the political parties yet, or are they, are they not yet making the mainstream mm -hmm. policy? I think they are... I think they're understood by some technocrats. Right. I think the I think Europe is making European policymakers are making a good faith effort to learn more. Uh, I think the British politicians are also making a good faith effort to, to learn more. I would say that the EU will probably regulate in this space in the next twelve to eighteen months. Um, the Americans will never regulate, right? They just don't have a they don't have an institution that, that will. There's no part of the government that oversees this um, in, in a particular way. They don't have a privacy commissioner. They they are. Elections Commission is locked in, in partisan bickering, so there's, there is no domain there that would regular step in for the Internet of Things. Here in the UK, um, the election rules are being reviewed mm. to sort of modernize them for the social mm. media era, and it's possible there'll be some good changes here. Right. So it's down to all of us to keep our eyes on this subject? And, and I think it's down to all of us to remember that when we install a piece of technology in our house, it is going to be used to make political inferences yeah. about what we want. Yeah. And uh, we have some choice over how those technologies communicate. Bracing times. Mm. Thank you very much for your... Thank you for coming.